Say, Curtis, what are we going to drink out of? So then he'll retrieve some glasses. Then I said, Curtis, we need some plates to eat off of. And he will retrieve the plates. And then I said, Curtis, if we were to spill anything, how would we wipe our mouths? But it is usually really a folded napkin, a very aesthetically pleasing folded napkin is usually the surest sign that a table has been set. And when do we know that the dishes have really been done? We usually know that the dishes have been done not because everything has been put away, not because there are pots and pans that are turned over inside the dish drain. We know that the dishes have been done when the floor has been swept, the broom has been put away, and usually the dish towel has been wrung and is folded across the sink. That's the sure sign that the dishes have been done. <laughs> now, how do we know that the laundry has been done? Do we know that the laundry has been done because we see a basket of clothes that just came out of the dryers sitting over in a corner on the floor? No. The laundry has been done when you can go to your chest of drawers and open a drawer and see your neatly folded undergarment in their proper places. Now, I'm told that that is a male perspective, but nevertheless, it is the surest sign that the laundry has been done. I recall once when I was on college break in Miami, staying with my spiritual mom, and it was the afternoon, and she came back from school, and she said, Victor, I thought I told you to make the bed. And I said, the bed's made. Look at it. She goes, no, it's not. She said, the sure sign that the bed has been made is there's usually a very clear fold underneath the pillows, and the bedspread falls in a certain way on each side. And that is the sure sign that the bed has been made. Now, in the research of his latest novel, The Weeping Chamber, the Christian fiction writer, Sigmund Brower, discovers another small but tremendously important detail to demonstrate that the work of God in Jesus Christ has indeed been finished. Brower found out that carpenters of the first century had a distinct way of letting their employers know that they had completed their job. Now, the average carpenter in the first century was illiterate in the sense of which we think of a formally educated person. They did not read, but that did not mean they were not educated because the saying source during that time was so strong that people remembered everything. And, and, and we know that people had memorized the gospel, that they had memorized the Iliad and the Odyssey and the epic Beowulf. Hence, they were educated, though perhaps not literate. And that may have been the case with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom himself was a carpenter. A carpenter would take a folded cloth and he would leave it in the corner of the work he had worked on. And that was the surest sign to the employer that the carpenter had indeed finished his work. He would leave this folded cloth in the corner. And the Johannine evangelist shares meticulously in his account of the resurrection of our Lord and Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he leaves his burial cloth. I wish somebody would pray with me. He takes his burial cloth, which had covered his face, and he separates it from the linen that had draped the rest of his body, and he leaves it folded in a corner where his dead body lay to let you and to let me know that we can now rejoice because the work of salvation has indeed been done. It is a finished work so that we no longer need to be bound to fear or the sin that would so easily and so quickly entangle us that because of this folded cloth that the Johannine evangelist sees over in a corner, this folded burial cloth, you and I are free to live the abundant and eternal life that God offers us in Jesus Christ. Like a good, industrious, and faithful Carpenter, the Lord Jesus, takes particular care on that first Easter Sunday morning to leave in a corner his folded burial cloth. And see, we, like the disciples, may come to this great and glorious way of life 
with our own ulterior motives. See, if we had been there, we probably would have just seen this folded cloth and would have thought it's just lying there. Why is it there even in the first place? For after all, they had had their own ideas of how the Messiah was supposed to come. And we know that everybody sitting at the Last Supper, just a few evenings prior to that great and glorious event on the first Easter Sunday morning, sitting at the Lord's Supper, everybody sitting at that last Passover meal was sitting there with ulterior motives. James and John had gone and asked for some of the highest cabinet positions. Peter wanted to be the Secretary of State. Simon the Zealot wanted to be the Secretary of Defense. Judas wanted to be the Secretary of the Treasury. We laugh, but we too may come to the table of God next Sunday with our own ulterior motives about what is going on at the Lord's table. We too may ask God for a covenant position in the world. And just as they had their problems because they had been tired of being subjugated by Rome, they were tired of having been annihilated almost by the Babylonians, subjugated by the Assyrians. And we too are subjugated by our own existential death. We die daily because of our various failures, our defeat, our termination from jobs. Some of us have been in prison. Some of us are addicted to alcohol, overeating. Some of us have lifelong resentments that we are holding on to. And we come dressed up in our designer clothes but they are really not our designer clothes as much as they are our grave clothes. Because in our hearts we are dead. We are resenting people. We are bitter people. We have strife in our hearts. There are many people we have not forgiven. Some of us have never even forgiven ourselves for ignorant things we did in our youth. And we are walking around breathing physically, but we are dead spiritually. And we are wearing designer clothes, but they are nothing more than our grave rags in this life. But I want you to know that there's good news for you today. And the good news is that the evangelist looked in the tomb and he saw that the burial cloth was folded, lying in a corner. And I would hope that on this 138th church anniversary that you might look upon this folded burial cloth and that you might see that Christ Jesus offers to us abundant and eternal life. You know, the story is told of the mother of the great poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who lived in existential death. Now, I know it must be the most horrible thing for a parent to lose a child. That has got to be the most unnatural thing that one could probably experience in life. And I do not make light of that experience at all. But Mrs. Dunbar never ever healed from that experience. And she built a shrine to her son, which was the room that he grew up in. And she would not allow anyone to touch anything in that room from the day he died. His very last poem that was written out in hand was on the desk, but it was at an angle where the sunlight came in and bleached it. So we do not have Dunbar's last poem because it was bleached. And this story, I think, adequately demonstrates what happens to those of us who do not overcome the existential death that we are so prone to, who do not overcome defeat, who do not overcome depression, who do not overcome our past hurts. Time eventually bleaches out all of the joy that is in our hearts. It eliminates all of the ambition that God has given us within our minds. But this folded burial cloth, if you will look into this empty tomb, should give us the hope to know that as Jesus says in John 19.30, it is finished that no matter what you have gone through, no matter how bad it has been, no matter how tremendous the pain, you can look upon this folded burial cloth and see that the Lord Jesus has completed a finished work in which he's conquered death and has given you a right to live to the fullest and thereby 
he reverses any curses to which we are prone. I hope that today at this 138th church anniversary, we will go forth rejoicing over this folded burial cloth, which assures us that death does not possess any lasting power over us. We share the hope of the resurrection. We can say, hallelujah, the Lord Jesus is indeed the first fruits of those raised from the dead, that we have a reserved place in the heavenly realms, that death cannot prevent us from arriving there safely, that there really is enough room for, God, for all of God's children, that in the end, failure, disappointment, defeat, and even death itself will not conquer us. This folded burial cloth reminds us that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us eternally, that we do not need to live in the fear of loss, that we will indeed win no matter what, that this folded burial cloth is the surest sign that victory is embedded in everything we do. In the larger world, where they see darkness, we see the light of God. Where they see defeat, we see our dependence upon God. Where they see failure, we see a fortified opportunity to grow closer to the gods whose we are and whom we serve. There's grace for us in this folded burial cloth when we personalize the resurrection. And in doing so, the Lord Jesus calls us to a process of growth. Now, I hope you don't get quiet on